In August of last year, we set out on phase one of construction here at Joy Church. The goal of phase one was to remove the trees, to blast and crush the gravel, lay out the parking lot, and install all of our utilities. And I'm excited to announce that we are 90% complete with this phase. Water and power are in the ground, and now we're just awaiting county approval to complete our fire and our septic lines. Once we get county approval, Shamrock will finish installing these remaining lines and will make our parking lot ready for paving. We have seen the Lord's miraculous provision and the outpouring of generosity here at Joy Church. We are right at phase one finish line and plan to celebrate and share stories of God's goodness at our Oktoberfest barbecue. There are so many stories to tell of His faithfulness through this process. Through the generosity of Joy Church and our Make Room campaign in 2023, along with the funds that we've set aside from our general income, we've been able to complete phase one debt free. Phase two, the building of our new sanctuary. We are at 80% complete with construction documents and we're in the final design phase, working with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing on the new sanctuary building. Once completed, we'll be able to submit for permits beginning in 2025. Our goal is to have everything ready to go in the spring of 25. And as we endeavor to have all the building logistics and plans completed by the spring, we are determined to wait beginning the actual building process until we have hit our courageous campaign funding goals. We're coming to the completion of phase one and will continue to prepare and save for phase two, the construction of a new sanctuary building. We are determined to stay within our means throughout the project. And as we work together to hit our financial goals and begin phase two, we're asking the question, what can we do in between? We wanna to continue to make progress while simultaneously allowing time to make the financial and planning progress needed to move forward in wisdom. We went back to the drawing board and we were able to detail a list of items that we had planned for phase two. Things like sidewalks and paving, fencing, landscaping, and a garage in the front of the property for all our storage. Even a block wall that separates the upper and the lower parking lots. All of these things can be implemented now and will help lessen some of the phase two costs. Additionally, this will restore our property to a more functional state during the construction process. We have been working with contractors, the bank, and the county to detail a plan that will keep us moving forward on this project. So what's next? Please pray for the completion of phase one as we are awaiting approval from the county on a few remaining items. What has been accomplished in phase one sets Joy Church up for the next 25 years. I recognize that as we drive onto the property, we see dirt and gravel piles, but let us not forget that the amount of work that's been done underground sets us up to build a brand new sanctuary and a future kids church building, enabling ministry for years to come. I wanna say thank you to everyone who has given generously to the building campaign as we endeavor to make room for those yet to come. There's been a lot that has taken place in the last year on this piece of property. If you're new, it didn't used to look like this outside. Uh, it looked a little bit different. And so we are in process of, of, of preparing for the next phase. It's exciting. It's amazing as well how long t stuff takes. Anyone else? You're just like, holy moly, why are we taking so long? Uh, I would love to just make it happen. But um, I also am so grateful for just the patience and the grace to be able to walk through it day by day, piece by piece as a church. Thank you, everyone, for serving, for giving, for being here, being a part, even the patience, um, you know, of, man, I can't believe your car gets dirty all the time. I'm so sorry, Nicole. Man, you, yeah, you poor thing. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, you've never lived on a dirt road. So um, we learned something about you today, didn't we? The, uh, yeah, yeah. I love it. We, uh, what, a, what a great place that we, we have today, and what an awesome church. How many of you guys love that this is your house, that the Lord brought you here? What a great place. I'm thankful that this is the house that God has called us to, that we get to be a part of, and uh, every, every single time I'm here on property, every time I come on a Sunday or wherever, wherever we're having a meeting, I'm, just, I'm, I'm grateful for what the Lord is doing in and through our lives, that He doesn't just leave us where we are, but he actually moves us along. I love seeing life transformation. I love seeing people's lives change for the better. I actually was just having a conversation with someone on Friday, and they had mentioned someone that they knew that went to our church, and I was, um, and I'm just thinking, man, they hadn't seen him for two years, and I'm thinking, you wouldn't recognize him. 
two years later, what the Lord has done in their life. And when they walked in, they were downcast and were holding heavy, heavy things. And all of a sudden, you see that the Lord starts changing and, and, and putting people around them and meeting them in their need and in their season. I'm thinking two years later, I'm like, you're not going to recognize the person that you used to know. And it's beautiful to be a part of a house and a church where the Lord is changing, maturing, growing, healing, freeing His people. And so I love being a part of that freedom process, that life transformation process. And I also love it in my own life. I love that the Lord just doesn't leave us where we are where we are. Like he loves us so much that he wants to continue to grow us. And so this is the heart behind the trade-in series, really letting go of the old so that we can take on the new. This will be a two-part series. And uh, it's actually, um, as we do series planning and prepare, we set out different series stuff that we're praying and asking the Lord what to do. And then I have a rolling list of things that are just like ideas, you know, things I'm putting together of like, oh, I want to do that. What about this? And so every once in a while, there's an opening in the schedule and I'm like, okay, which one do I get to take. This is one of those that I've been praying about, thinking about for uh, a little while, the trade-in series. And um, I I love it. I just, I I love the idea and I love the concept of really turning in something that's old in order to gain something that's new. Um, More than likely, by the time we're finished today, you might even say, I didn't see that coming. God has some good things in store for us today, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, I want to ask, Lord, would you come? Would you come and be a part Come be a part. We are here to celebrate you, to glorify you in all things. We ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for what you have for us today. May we be open and receptive to hearing your word and following through in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. How many of you guys have ever been to Hawaii? Anyone? Come on. This is awesome. I've been one time, one time to Hawaii, uh, and I didn't even make it to a hotel. In fact, I slept in a tent the whole time. Um, I never got in the water either. Yeah. I got issues. I got issues. <laughs> I just, anyway, I, um, let me explain, I guess, huh? I went to Kauai 15 years ago. Actually, I was, um, at the time, we had just had Titus, our oldest son, and Rachel was going to go visit her family in Ireland. And so maybe you've heard this story before. I'll give you a little twist on it. But uh, Rachel wanted to visit her family in Ireland, and I said, go, go visit them. We were going to be bringing a missions team over there two weeks later. So she went two weeks early to go be with her family, and then we're bringing a team over to meet. And uh, so I was left all alone, just by myself. And as a typical um, in Ben Miller fashion, I'm thinking, let's squeeze something in, let's do something. And so I rearranged my shifts. I found a couple days that I could just take off. I called a friend of mine who's an airline pilot who used to get buddy passes. And uh, I said, hey, I got five days. Where should I go? What should I do? And he says, you should go hiking. Like, have you ever been to Hawaii? And I said, no, I've never been to Hawaii. He says, you should go to Hawaii and uh, you should go hiking. He said, I'll get you a buddy pass. And I was like, sounds good to me. You know, like, I mean, why wait to go to Hawaii with my wife when I could just go by myself? And she left and took the kid. And so I was like all alone. So no joke, I rearranged my shifts. I got a $45 flight, flew first class to Hawaii. And, um, that's what they used to get buddy passes to airline pilots anyway. Uh, and so I flew first class over to Hawaii with my backpack. And I remember I was excited because originally he was saying, go find a hike in Hawaii. So I, I Google searched, no joke. I just Google searched, you know, best hikes in Hawaii. And I found this one, uh, on, um, I started kind of looking around, and then once I figured out, here's the top 10, I was like, all right, then let's like, let's like narrow the search down to this, the most difficult. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, so anyway, I found this really cool hike on the Nepali coast. It's in the northern part of Kauai, and I, I, I was reading through it, and it was like, you know, difficult and challenging, the most difficult and challenging hike in, in, in all of Hawaii. And I'm like, Pfft, I'm 25. 195 pounds, I got this, like, I can, I can make this thing happen. I was doing CrossFit at the time and uh, in really, really good shape, and I thought, like, I can make this thing happen. I have hunted, but I never hiked. <laughs> anyway, here's what I forgot to Google search. I forgot to Google search, like, recommended backpack weight for said trip. Forgot to do that. Uh, my buddy loaned me a backpack or a bag, you know, a hiking bag, and I was like, this is going to be great, and loaned me a tent. I started kind of putting stuff together. Just, just an FYI, if you do ever Google search recommended weight for said trip, it's going to be 20% of body weight. That's what it is. You're welcome for that. Um, and uh, if you're going to do a day trip, it's only 10% of body weight. Well, anyway, I ended up packing this bag as if I was moving to Hawaii. 
it is, it, is, it is actually 15 years later, still so shameful what I actually put in there. Some of the things I don't even want to tell you, but uh, I put in two one-gallon Ziploc bags of trail mix. It, this is a shameful moment right now, I'm just telling you. Like, I had three pair of jeans, not lightweight, hiking pants. I never even brought shorts. I don't even know what was happening. The reality is I blame it on Rachel. She was gone. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was spinning. I packed every single pouch of this bag. Like, you know, what if I need this? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I put in fingernail clippers for a five-day hike. I now realize my fingernails were already clipped. I didn't probably need them, but I brought them just in case. Like, maybe Hawaii would get my nails really grown out big or something. Like, I don't know. And I just started packing stuff of like, yeah, what if I need this? And man, I wouldn't want to be without that. And I'm like, I think I brought my, I was like, I'll bring my small Bible. Oh my word. Like I just packed this bag to the absolute gills over and over. And it was, it was horrible. And I realized, like, I didn't know at first. I first got in, I thought, man, that's heavy, you know, but I'm thinking I'm strong. I got this. This will be great. And uh, I get on the flight and I'm flying over. And it was like, there were signs along the way, you know, like when you go to put your bag and lock it in and give it to them so they can put it on the flight. And they're looking at you going, um, what are you going to do? You know, it's like, are you moving? No, I'm, I'm just going on a five-day hike by myself, you know. Like, okay, you know, like, are you sure that's, you, you have enough stuff? And <laughs> Like, there was those kind of comments along the way, you know. Even when I got off and I started, I hitchhiked, actually. I hitchhiked up to the northern coast. And I remember the person, there's a couple other people hitchhiking in the same area, going to go hike it. And I'm just, they're looking at me like, kind of with this weird eye of like, do you think you overpacked? You know, I'm like, no, I think I got everything. I think, I don't think I missed anything. I hope I didn't miss anything, you know. And there was this moment on the trip where all of a sudden I start, I'm about three miles in, and, uh, and that bag is heavy. It was 40% of my body weight. <laughs> Just to say that. <laughs> oh, and I'm thinking like, why is everybody looking at me funny on this trail, you know? There, comes, there came this point about three and four miles in where there's a, it's a small cliff edge and it's about 500 feet down to the water. So it's really, really tight. And, uh, and people are going, when you, when you come to someone on that trail, you no joke have to like grab each other and you kind of shuffle in a circle so that you can make the next turn. And so uh, I see people coming, which is great. So the first person we're shuffling and you know, it's just this wonderful intimate moment with someone you don't know, <laughs> hoping you don't die together. And, um, and the first guy's looking at me like, nice bag. And I'm like, Thanks, you know, and uh, I think it finally struck when it was the girl behind him and we were, you know, we were like, we're holding on to each other's bags going in a circle and she's looking at me and she goes, do you think you overpacked? I said, I I'm starting to feel that. Yeah, I'm starting to catch on. She says, you know, recommended weight would probably only be like 35 pounds, maybe 40 pounds for you. How much do you think you have in there? And I'm like, I, I didn't want to throw her off, but at the same time, I'm like, no. Nah. Maybe, you know, what's going to happen here? Something could happen. Oh, I realized about four or five miles in shortly after that, like, I'm obviously carrying way more than I should. And at some point on each step of the way, like I got the worst shin splints, by the way, during that time. Um, I started to like think through what was in my bag. And I realized, um, although this was stuff I was holding on to, it's possible this stuff was actually holding on to me. Because I was like, I started thinking through like, well, what if I don't have clean clothes? Or what if I run out of food? Or like, I don't want to run out of food. You know, what if, what, if, what if I get stuck? Or what if this happens? And like, I had prepared for every scenario and tried to shove it all in my backpack. Uh, and I had packed every single piece of this pouch. But what I failed to recognize is that by packing everything that I felt like I owned, I actually had no room for anything else. I had no room for souvenirs. I had no room for like local fruit. I had no room. If I found something I wanted, I had no room to put that on. My bag was at complete limit. And I remember it was about three, four miles in. I'm sitting here going, this is super heavy. I ended up taking a, a, another gear bag and I stuffed it full of lots of nuts, trail mix, you know, jeans that I felt like I could live without these. You started anticipating the things that you could live without. And I put probably another 20, 25 pounds aside. I hid it for my way out uh, just because it was so shameful carrying it in. Um, and I carried less in, but I remember like each step of the way recognizing like the journey's getting harder and harder and like we're climbing, I'm climbing hills. And it's just the weight that I was carrying 
just was absolutely overwhelming. I didn't have any extra room to enjoy the journey because I had carried so many things and I'd packed my, my life with all of these different things. I was actually thankful that I was by myself because if I had a friend with me, they would have mocked me forever, you know? Like they would have never let me, let me hold it down. But the same is true actually when we come to Jesus for the first time. When we come to the Lord in our walk of faith or in our journey with the Lord, what we find is that we often show up completely overwhelmed, completely overpacked, and we're full of things in our lives that bad choices, consequences, mistakes, even sin that we hold on to, but things like anger and rage or sometimes a relationship pain or grief or impurity, like, like when we actually show up and meet Jesus for the first time, typically our bags and our lives are completely packed to the gills full of things that we are just like, I'm tired of carrying. And I can tell you that each new step with 40% of your body weight, I'm just thinking, I don't care about this anymore, and I don't care about that anymore. And I had a good long time to think through these things, but it is true. We show up really to relationship with Jesus, and we recognize, or sometimes when we come close to him, it's almost as if there's a giant light of exposure that shined on our, our life when we go, why am I carrying so much? Why am I carrying so much grief and pain and sorrow and anger? And we can show up at church and what we find is that we meet Jesus and we, we almost get to this point where all of a sudden we start to join a community. Maybe our life starts to change and, and we feel like we have hope for the first time. And, and we start to join life group and we get involved in community. And the next thing you know, it's like, hey, you need to read your Bible and you need to go to church and you need to join a group. And it's like we're, we're trying to push people in this direction. But it's interesting is that we can almost show up to a place where it's a long list of things that you feel like you just need to work on rules. And maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a parent or a friend or something like that that puts this wonderful list on your fridge. And it's like, hey, you need more kindness in your life. You need more patience. And you're thinking to yourself, cool, sounds great. You know, like, where do I get that? Because the things that we carry are actually weighing us down. And, and the reality is we don't know what to do with them. And they hurt. And then all of a sudden we get this big, long list of you need to learn to grow in love for others. And you need to be humble. And you need to be gentle. And you need to be all these things. And we recognize, I actually don't know how to do that. And I don't even know where it would go, to be honest. I don't know how I could complete this big, long list of everything that you need for me. But uh, also, we can step back and we look at it and we'd be like, that's great that I need more patience. Um, how do I get more patience? Like, was there a moment that they were handing out kindness in the lobby and I for just forgot? Like... Did I miss it somehow when you were handing it out that there's this just kindness thing? And we, we recognize that although we want to grow in areas of kindness and peace and love towards others and humility and thankfulness, you recognize sometimes when you get home, like, but where would I put it? I'm carrying way too many things. And it's the heaviness that we carry, the guilt that we carry, the, the shame I talked about last week that we carry. It's all these anger and rage and things that we carry in our life that we go, I wouldn't even know where to start because I'm already holding on to so many things. Even if we were handing out kindness in the lobby, the truth is we don't have space to pack it. Like, where would I put kindness in? How would that happen? The point I'm trying to get to is that we actually have to give something up in order to gain something new. Hence, trade in. We actually have to be willing to get rid of some things in order to gain others. And it's not until we get to the point that we're, full, you know, whatever, halfway down the trail and your shins are hurting like crazy and you recognize because everybody's making comments, I might just be carrying a ton of weight in life. And we do, we carry grief and sorrow and relationship pain and decision pain. There are things that we carry that we don't know how to get rid of and we do want something new and something better in the life of Christ, but we're just stuck with what we have. This is the point, the hope, even of this uh, two-part series, is that we actually have to recognize that I cannot put on kindness until I'm ready to take off anger. Like, I can't put on generosity until I'm actually willing to remove discontentment or greed. Like, I can't put on holiness until I'm willing to actually let him take apart and take off impurity. 
Like we have to be able to trade. I can't, I can't just love others well unless I'm willing to actually start to cut away at the love for self. And there's this process that the Lord wants to walk each and every one of us through in our journey of faith that He wants to do all these good things inside of us. And you've, maybe you've heard this fruit of the Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, patience. Like He wants to do all these things in you, but if we're not willing to let go of anything, those things never can take root or have space to actually grow. And sometimes in our American culture and mindset, we've, we've tried to communicate to ourselves that more is better. But there comes to a point where your cup is full, your life is full, and you have no more space for anything. So even if you want it to start growing in these things and work on these things, you actually have to be willing to get rid of a few things in order to let the new things take root and find a place to live in you. We try to do the right things, but we can't just add, 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 add. We have to get to a place where we're actually willing to step back and subtract Paul gives us this really cool pattern, and uh, today we're actually going to be in, second, or in Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 3 for homework. If you want, if some of you guys want homework, uh, go back and reread this week Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 3. I'm going to teach through it. If you don't want homework, um, you should just read it anyway. You don't have to call it homework. You can call it whatever you want. Um, maybe you don't have enough time in your life to even sit down and read two chapters of the Bible. Maybe this series is just for you. Maybe there's something you need to cut away in order to find some time to be able to sit with the Lord and say, God, what is it you want to remove so that you can add? And that's a question that we need to be willing to ask. Colossians 3, chapter 5, I love this, says this, so put to death the sinful and earthly things lurking within you. What a great scripture. He gave us permission to kill, to kill things. So put to death the earthly th things lurking within you, verse 8 says, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. He starts to give us this long list of things that we actually need to trade in and get away from. Verse 9 and 10 says this, don't lie to each other for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. He says, now put on the new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become just like him. And he actually uses these two words, which are they're really cool words, but he uses them throughout Colossians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 3, the take off and the put on. It's this trading concept of like, he actually continues to say, although here's all the things that you need to put on because of your new life in Christ, here's all the things that you actually have to take off. And he lists for us all of these trades back and forth and back and forth. But in order to put on, you have to be able to take off. This is the point he's trying to make to, the, to this church is he's trying to let them know you can't just add, add, add. This isn't, this isn't my life was going okay and now that I have Jesus, I'm just going to try and tack all of his stuff onto it. No, this is the like, I actually need to remove things in my life in order to make him priority number one. And I need to remove some things in my life so that... And I need to remove the old sinful nature is what he actually calls it. The sinful nature, this thing holding on to us that, like, that desires bad things, that continues to walk us into places that we're going, why am I here again? And how come I can't get rid of this? It's the stuff that you try to shake and you can never shake. It's the stuff that like I've tried my best. I've worked my hardest. And I felt like it did really good for about two days or a month, or maybe six months, and all of a sudden you're like, and it's just coming back to get me again. And you find yourself stuck in these patterns over and over and over again. He's talking about removing that piece of your old nature so that you can actually take on his nature, his goodness. And I love even how he says this, is so that we can learn to know our creator and become like him. And sometimes we can step into a Christian community, we can give our hearts to Jesus, and we can all of a sudden be given this whole list of what we feel are rules. Rules, 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 rules. Here's what you do, don't do. Do, don't do. Do, don't do. And the point is not that you would learn all the rules. The point is actually that you would know God and become like him. And this is the difference between a relationship with the Lord and actually just trying to like appease your guilty conscience, and try and do everything right. At the, end, at the end of your lifetime, you're not going to stand up to the Lord and say, look it, I did it all right. <laughs> he's going to laugh at you. And he's going to say, no, you didn't. Because it isn't about you doing it all right. 
He wants to look at you and say, says, I see my faith in yours. The question is not, can you do it right? The question is, do you look like him? And you have to know him in order to look like him. John the Baptist had this right. Um, John the Baptist was actually sent before Jesus to announce that the Messiah was coming. That was his, his whole thing in life. In fact, he was out, he was kind of a weird looking guy and uh, it says that he wore like camel clothes and ate locusts and had long hair and he was out by the, by the river and he was baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sin and he was announcing that a Messiah was coming. The Messiah was here and the Messiah was gonna, gonna arise. He was actually announcing Jesus' arrival and at that time, Jesus was already alive. So John the Baptist starts collecting really this big following of his own disciples and people were coming out and they were starting to dedicate their life and give themselves and man I want to follow the Lord and and this big kind of this group started following well then Jesus shows up on the scene John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and then all of a sudden Jesus starts the his ministry years which is what you can read in Matthew Mark Luke and John in the Bible it's the New Testament it's the story of Jesus and the story of John the Baptist is mentioned at the beginning of those and uh, all of a sudden these disciples of John realize something. They realize that now that Jesus is on the scene, like he's starting to take all their followers. And their influence, the followers are like dwindling a little at a time. It's like, man, I was a part of a great church. And now it's like, it just keeps dwindling and dwindling. What's happening here? And they were part of a following with John the Baptist. So they actually go to John the Baptist and they're like, everyone is leaving us and going over to Jesus. Like we're losing our credit. We're losing our followers. We're like losing our influence. Like I was a disciple of John. And so now everybody's leaving. Like it's no longer cool to be a disciple of John. What's going to happen? And John makes this comment to his disciples as really his following is dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. In John 30, in verse, uh, John 3, verse 30, he says this, I must become, or he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. In fact, the English standard version says, he must increase, but I must decrease. I don't know if you've heard this before. I love this just concept for John. He recognized it's not about him. John wasn't trying to build followers or disciples unto himself. He was trying to build them unto Jesus. And there comes a point where all of a sudden John realized and had to actually teach his disciples, it's not about us building this clout or influence or followers. It's 100% about us knowing God and becoming more like him. And in order for that to happen, I must become less and less. And he must become greater and greater. And this is the concept really of the trade-in idea is that in my life, I must become less and less. And the less and less in my life is the less and less of the sinful, evil desires and the things I'm holding on to so that the more that I can gain is him. And this is the hope behind this really quick two-off series is that we would recognize something in me has to go in order to gain him. Sometimes we just want to keep adding things and it doesn't work like that. Jesus isn't an add-on to your life. You have got to remove things or be willing to remove things. And sometimes I've heard people, man, I've even, I've, I've heard people, I would say we've even, all, probably all of us have been at this time where you're like, I'm done changing. You know, like I'm, I'm done working. I'm done you just taking things off my life. I'm, I'm done going through this, you know. We get to a point where we can get tired of, uh, of the process of, of the removal of us. But the beauty is every time he comes in and he fills that space with him. And the more that we do that process, the more I think that we actually get to a place where we're like, I actually like myself better than I did 10 years ago. To be honest, I think I'm a lot cooler than I was. <laughs> I enjoy myself more today because it's less of me and more of him. And we should. But if you're actually sick and tired of yourself and you don't even like you, it's a good possibility that you needs to go little piece by little piece so that more of him can come into a place where you're like, I actually, I, I tell this to the Lord, but I also tell this to Rachel. I feel like they're doing a really good job in my life. You know, Jesus is doing a great job changing me. And Rachel's done an incredible job changing me. <laughs> um, I'm actually okay with that because I recognize the less of me and the grossness and the sin nature, the more of him I can have. So Paul actually 
lists this out in chapter two and chapter three. He lists all these trade-ins. Here's things that must go. And I have a whole list, scattered list for you here. But he's actually, if you read through both chapters, this, this starts the list, and you obviously probably have other lists, but things in us that we're holding on to that none of us like about ourselves anyway. Things that we got to let go of, impurity, evil desires, dirty language, racism. He even hits it in here. Sexual immorality, looking down on others, lust, pride, rage, slander, thinking less of others, and anger, and greed, and drunkenness, the haughty spirit that looks down on everyone, lying, even the worship of others he lists in here is like when we actually take someone that we like, that we say, oh, they have influence, and we almost worship other people instead of worshiping him. We, we exalt them over everything. Oh, I want to be like them. I wish I could have their life. I wish I could be just like them, like selfishness and malicious behavior. Like he goes, he goes through these, these lists, and he keeps hitting it over and over in chapter two and chapter three of Colossians of like, here are all the things in your life that get to go. And also, if you look at this, don't worry, we're not going to have you raise your hand or identify which one you just struggle with. <laughs> we'll let yourself identify. But I can tell you, you all have something on that list. Because I do too. And I look at that and go, man, there's things on that list. Those are the things I don't like about myself. Those are, there's things in here I'm going, like, oh man, like, I don't like that. That's the part of me. That's the sin nature piece of our life that we're going, man, this stuff has to go. But the beauty is, is there's a trade-in value because these are the things that we take off. And I love it because in chapter three, verse five, he says this. So these are the things that we put to death. That's it. These are the things that we put to death. All that list so we can let it go. But then there's a put on aspect. Colossians chapter three, verse 12. I want to read this. Since God chose you to be a holy people, he loves uh, people. He lo I'm going to read that in the correct, I'm going to use the comma in the right spot. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah? Since God chose you to be a holy people, he loves, comma. You must choose yourselves. Or, you must close yourself. <laughs> I got so caught up in the first sentence. It was, I love that about myself, too. Um, you must... <laughs> I can do this. I need someone to read for me. That's what I need. You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are things we're called to put on, by the way. Make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Man, wouldn't it be amazing if we all clothed ourselves in just thankfulness? Instead of having a conversation with somebody where it's like wine and wine and wine, there's actually a conversation that says, but I'm thankful, but I'm thankful. I had a, I preached in Ireland this summer, and um, just as I was getting ready to preach, I was, it was actually Gateway Church in Tolo, and I was feeling bad about myself because the previous time that I preached there, I was like in the, just, just really doing great, but just starting out typhoid. Josh was with me at the time, and um, I remember I preached, it was in October, no, it was in November of 2022 at this church, and I remember like the music, it was like it was like pounding, and I was feeling so sick, I don't, I mean, I, I remember pieces of it, but I felt so bad, because I was really, really sick, and then of course I'm like, man, I feel like I didn't bring my best, and I, I would have let Josh preach, but then I figured I'll do it anyway, you know, <laughs> and um, I, I actually, I preached, anyway, I preached something, I shared some of my own testimony. Anyway, all that to say, this time we're back at Gateway Church. This is in uh, June of this year. I'm getting ready to go up, and I'm like, man, I, I like, I'm thankful that I feel better. I'm thankful, and I'm like, man, I want to serve, I love this church, I want to serve the people well. And a guy came up to me, he ran up to me, and, uh, and he says, hey, before you, before you go up and preach, I want to say something. I said, yeah. And he says, the last time you were here, and I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> He says, the last time you were here, you gave your testimony, and you talked about how you were struggling with depression and anxiety, and what happened was, all of a sudden, it's like you started, 
you recognized when you were feeling that way and you started shifting to a place of thankfulness and thankfulness drug you out of anxiety and drug you out of, of like depression. And I was like, yes. And he said, he said, when you, when you preached, he says, my wife and I went home and we, we started counting our blessings. And he says, within two weeks, he says, the depression left, anxiety left. And he says, and we, have an ex- we have not experienced depression the entire time that you've been gone. He says, now, last week, he said, for the first time, my wife looks at me and she says, I'm back there again. And he says, do you remember what that one guy from America said? He says, we got we to gotta get back to gratefulness and thankfulness. And they sat down and he says, within two hours, everything lifted in our home. And he says, I didn't know you were going to be here today. He says, that was yesterday. And I just remember going like, oh man, not in my strength, but my weakness. And I praise you, God. Thankfulness is something that we've got to put on. Yeah. It's not something you put on and you're like, well, it just sticks with me. No, you've got to, you've got to activate it. You actually have to make a choice. And this is the beauty of this list of love and kindness and humility. We have to choose to take something off in order to put it on, but we also have to choose to put that on. We can't just keep taking things off. We actually need to stop and we need to put something on. Forgiveness is a choice. Gratefulness is a choice. These are choices that we make in the middle of really, really hard times. And the point that Paul's trying to make, I think the point that John saw and the point that the Lord's trying to make in Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 3 is we've got to make room in our lives. We've got to take some off. We've got to be willing to say, what is it that I need to take off and what is it that, Lord, that you want me to put on? Because we recognize that anger and kindness are not roommates. And if you're struggling in your home with anger and fits of rage, kindness isn't going to live there. And you can't just try and put a coat of kindness over anger and rage. You can't do it. You, like, you can't just say, well, I'm, gonna put, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be a generous person. Yet you struggle with discontentment, you struggle with greed, and you struggle with like, self-preservation. You're always in fear of like, well, we've got to make sure we have enough. We've got to make sure we're like, like what I did, my, you know, like what I did in Hawaii with a backpack that's 40% of my body weight. Like, hello, how can I be free and easy if I'm going to pack my life full of things that I'm just like, but what if? But what if? Like, you cannot just put on a... A clothe yourself in humility while wearing underneath pride. They don't work like that. We have to be willing to take something off in order to put something on. And this process, I love this, is us becoming more like Christ when we take off our old sinful nature in order to put on the things of Christ. Colossians 3.10, to learn to know your creator and become just like him. This is our heart and our hope actually, and I actually feel like this is a theme that we're going to carry in and through this fall, knowing, because I know the next series, by the way, so just a little teaser in that. I know what's coming, and I can tell you that the heart and the desire, even for this next season, so this fall for us, is that we would know God and become more like Him. We just want to, we want to be more like Him, and that is actually what is amazing. Next week, what I'm going to do is I want to identify some of the key trade-ins in order to make room. So what is it we have to trade in in order to operate in gentleness and put on? What is it we have to trade in to operate in kindness? What is it we have to trade in to put on patience? What is it we have to trade in to put on humility? I want to kind of link some of those together. Because we can't expect to take off one thing and not understand what the trade-in is is. I want to link those together. He actually gives us a lot of these links in here, but I want, to, I want to kind of walk through them a little piece by piece. But for the rest of our time today, I actually want to finish with a theme because I feel like it's a, there's a one more question that needs to be answered before we move into the trade-off piece. I want to actually look at why sometimes we go to trade in and it doesn't work. Because sometimes we, you know, give our heart to Jesus and we, we, we show up to church and we start getting a life group and we start to like do all these things, read my Bible and, and we're like, we're maybe in a worship service or in a moment we're like, okay, God, I'm going to hand in anger and, you know, I'm asking that you would, that I would start to operate in kindness and, and then like you go home, you go to bed, you wake up the next day and that car's still in the driveway. And you're thinking, but I, tr- but I, I want to get rid of it. And you're like, but I don't know, like the... Honest truth is, sometimes we've tried to trade stuff in, and the trade-ins didn't work. And we're sitting here going, um, I'm still really struggling with anger. 
I still really feel like I'm operating in fear. I still feel like I'm operating in these things. When you look at that big, long list of everything we're, we're, we're working through, it's like, man, I really want to do this, but I feel like the trade-in's not working. And so what happens is maybe we're like, well, then let's just try harder. You know, like I'm going to up my church attendance. I'm going to join a life group. Josh says if I join a life group, it'll change everything. So, <laughs> right? I'm going to read my Bible. I'm just going to, I'm just going to work harder. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work harder. And you realize it's still not working. I'm trying to trade in, but this trade isn't happening. It's not working right. So then, man, what if I just like, what if I like deny myself? I'll fast. I'll start casting stuff out and yelling at things. I'll start prayer shouting or all, you know, like, <laughs> Like, I'm going to get really serious, and we try to, like, buckle down for a season only to find out, like, I, I can't figure this trade-out thing. I can't figure how to trade it in. And then all of a sudden, we're like, you know what? I'm going to go really serious. I'm going to punish myself. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to push myself. I'm going to whip myself into shape. Paul actually says that all of those things are great for your physical body, but they miss something. Listen to this. Colossians 2.23. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. So we try, we go hard 75 or whatever it is, like we're just going to discipline ourselves into it. We're going to figure it out, but it has no help in conquering the passions and the desires in our own life. Paul actually, and here's the beauty of this, We're looking at chapter 3, and in chapter 2, he actually gives us the reason why sometimes our trade-ins don't work. And I love this. As I'm studying through it, I'm just like, this is too good to not share. The process of trade-in is actually step 3. And the issue is, if we forget step 1 and 2, step 3 never works. And so we can want all the time. And we can try and will ourselves into it, and we try and discipline ourselves into it, but if we don't recognize that the trade-in only works as step three, we have to have step one and step two. And in Colossians chapter two, he defines it for us. I have it up here. Step one, as he defines it, really is the accepting of Christ as Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's step one of, of being saved, of repenting of your sins. A prerequisite to salvation is the understanding where sin sits and, and actually coming into a place of humility that says, I repent of my sin. I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I, want, I, want, I know that you've forgiven me of my sin. And it's actually this moment where we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's step one. He defines step two as water baptism, which I'm going to read to you out of Colossians 2 here in a second. And then step three is the take off and the put on peace. But if we just try to step into step three and take off the old sin nature and put on his nature, but we, f- we actually don't walk through step one or step two, step three doesn't work. And he's trying to give us this process of our salvation. We don't just pick the end process. And we as humans are so impatient, we just want the fruit. We forget the fact that there's also a peace in there that is repenting of your sin, accepting him, identifying with him in water baptism. Listen to this, Colossians 2, chapter 6. And now, just as you've accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue. See how he gives you a step one? Now that you've accepted the Lord, here's your very next step. That's your step one. You must continue to follow him. Let your roots go down into him. Let your lives be built upon him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Step one, we actually need to pursue him. There is life after salvation. The hard part is when we come to him burdened and heavy and downcast and we repent of our sin and he forgives us our sin, we all of a sudden get hope for the first time. We have, we're excited for the first time and it almost feels like I made it as if, as if it's the finish line that you've crossed through of like, oh, I did it, you know, I found Jesus and my whole life changed and now I can just, I don't know what I do. But it's actually the starting point of your life, not the ending point. Salvation is what we start on the journey to get to know him and to become like him. This is the beauty of it, is that salvation is step one where we jump into it and we say, okay, then what's next? Because he has something next for you. Listen to this in Colossians 2, 12. It says this, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. He's mentioning a step two. 
And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Something happens in water baptism where he actually cuts our sin nature. What identifies with his death, burial, and resurrection? It's not just me. It's my sin nature. There's something spiritual that takes place when we identify with him in the physical body act of water baptism, but also the spiritual act where he actually cuts away our sin nature so that step number three is actually possible. So he not, has not yet been cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of all the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing them on the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. I love this. Because last week we talked about shame and how when we come to him and we are ashamed, he silences the accuser in our life. And this is the beauty when we say, man, I want to I uh, you know, be baptized today, I'm going to go public with my faith. You know what the coolest part about being public with your faith is? Is that the enemy is publicly shamed. <laughs> and you get to have your sin nature cut off and raised into a new nature of life with him that starts the next process, which is the takeoff and the put-on process. It's possible when we look at this, like water baptism as a step number two, is we, we say we identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's our old sin nature, our old man and old woman that go down under the water, and the new man and the new woman come out. Why? Because we bury, cut off, put to death the old man, so that we can be raised to new life. Our shirts, when you get water baptism, they, baptized, they say raised to life. Sometimes you go like, well, what does that mean? That means your old self, your sin nature, the things that you're holding on to, that whole list of things that you're like, I'm trying to get rid of. That's the stuff we bury. That's the stuff we put to death. In fact, that word put to death means to starve, to starve of any life. We put it in the ground, we put it in the water, and we are raised to new life. We are made alive in Him, now with a clean slate, now forgiven, and now ready for step number three. But if we're trying to do step number three without actually repenting, accepting His forgiveness, having our sin nature cut away and pulled away and raised to new life, step number three doesn't work. So you keep trying to trade stuff in and it doesn't work because you're still attached to the old man and to the old woman. You're attached to it. This is why, when we look at it, this is why we don't baptize babies. This is why we don't baptize people who haven't stepped into step one. Even children, we wait for them to hit this point where they're actually aware of their sin to a place that is tired of their sin, to a place that says, I got to repent of my sin. And I understand that there are different religions that would baptize as babies because they believe that baptism is unto salvation and they would not want to miss that. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to get step two in before you, someday you hit step one. Personally, I don't think step three works without step one and two. And I don't think step two works without step one. So when we step back and we look at this, we, need, we, we actually want to walk someone through this process. This is step one. Aware of our sin, understanding. And maybe you're baptized as a child or maybe you're baptized as a baby and you look at it and you ask that question like, what, did I miss something? Did I get it wrong? And I've talked to so many people who are in that place of like, my parents made this decision for me, but I don't know if I made this decision. Like my encouragement to you, let's just put everything in order. If number three is not working, then let's just go back and put it all in order. Why don't we step back into a place that gives our heart to him, that, it, that repents of our sin, that does step one correctly. Let's get back to a place that says, man, I, I, wanna, I, I need to be baptized. I, I, I want to make the decision for myself to go public with my faith. But I also recognize I'm struggling with the trade in peace. I'm struggling with the take off and the put on nature. Let's go back and finish step two. Then we can step into step three, which would be our heart and our hope as we step into this series. But I, I just felt like as we went into it, like, 
I'm going to preach next week, step three. But if you're not ready and you haven't taken one and two, you can take notes, but you're not there. And so we have to be able to do it in the right manner. And I'm not trying to, maybe, maybe you've never taken step one. Maybe you're sitting here going, I never gave my heart to Jesus. Like, I, I, never, I never did that. Well, come on. Today's a great day. The Bible says if you confess your sins, come to him in repentance. Paul, you know, Peter even said in Acts chapter 2, they're like, what do we do? And he said, repent, therefore, and receive. And so our very first step that we take is we actually just repent of our sins. And that's a conversation you have with the Lord where you say, God, I'm, I repent of my sin. I realize that my sin has separated you and me in relationship. And man, if I'm going to know you and if I'm going to be like you, I got to be close to you, which means I need to be made right with you. Jesus Christ came and gave his life as a ransom for your sin. He died on the cross so that you could be made right with God so that you can be in relationship with him. But you cannot look like him if you do not know him. And so we humble ourselves and we repent of our sin and we come humbly before him. God, would you forgive us of our sin? And if you've never made that choice right now in your own words, God, we repent. Would you forgive us? Would you make us right and righteous? Would you forgive us all of our sins? Would you cancel the record of charges against us? And would you take them away by nailing them on the cross? God, we choose together just to step into step one, the forgiveness of our sin. Thank you. Thank you that you forgave us. Thank you that you made a way. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone. You didn't say, let's start over. You actually chose to come and meet us where we are and to be with us. And so God, we say thank you for that. And we love you. And we desire to be more like you. And step two, If you have not been baptized, maybe you're baptized as a child or as an infant, and you go, man, I don't even like, I don't even know how or why I made the choice. I just remember I was, or my parents told me I was, or maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe it's a brand new thing to you. What we end up doing is we ask someone to share their story about step one. What did God do in your life? What's he, what, what, who, who were you before Christ? And he wants to turn you into something new. We ask him to share a story. And what we do is the Bible actually says that we, we, we believe in full submersion. We take them and we bury and bring back to life, whether it's in a river or in a tub. We bring full submission and full submersion into a place of brand new life. And if you've never been baptized, we want to give you opportunity. We do several opportunities throughout the year. We just finished one at the river, which was wonderful. What a beautiful moment with all of those people and their families. Um, we're going to have another one in November. On November 10th, we'll have time. But if you're like, but I don't want to, I, I would like step two before I, we talk about step three. What we're going to do is next week during first and second service, it's supposed to be nice and sunny. The fall's over and summer's back. It's true. I checked the weather. So anyway, we're going to have a water baptism outside under the trees in between services. If you're like, man, I want to fill this in, invite your family, show up. We're also going to ask you to, to, to help build your story. Let's, let's, let's sign up for it. Like if you can let us know on an app or let us know in the, in the, uh, in the connect card, like let us, I want to be baptized. Someone will follow up with you this week and we're just going to make it available between services next week out in the trees, a beautiful setting, pray over you, let you share your story and baptize people because we don't want you to miss step three, which is the removal of and the putting on and being just like him. So in this process, we want to make it available all the time. And if you can't make next week and you can't make November 10th, then man, tell your life group leader. Tell someone, we will get you dunked. We will get you dunked. And one time I had someone call me and it's like, I won't go into the whole story, but they said, my whole family's in town. And uh, I told them I was getting baptized and it's not going to work out where I was. What do I do? And I said, well, when do you need to be baptized? Like tomorrow, sweet, where do you want to be baptized? I don't care. Meet you at the river. We met their family. It was just a single family time. Like, why not? We don't have to do 100 people. One at a time works. When somebody has accepted the Lord as their Savior in a step one, it's time to identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, to go public with your faith. Public for you, but remember, oh, public for him. 
for the evil one who is shamed the moment that we cut off our old sin nature. We raised to newness of life to be like him, to step into step number three, which is how do we take off and how do we put on? We want to make it available. So if you want to know more, come talk to us. Come down and get prayer. We will point you in the right direction. Fill out an app. Fill out, get a QR code. Like we'll make it available. Show up next week and we will walk you through it. But we don't want you to miss the power of step three. Giving your heart to him. Identifying with him in his death, burial, and resurrection through water baptism. And then we start the trade-in process. So Lord, we give this day to you. God, would you lead us on a journey? Thank you that salvation is not the end point, but the goal point, the start point of our life. Would you lead us and guide us in all things? Lord, would you help us with all the heavy things that we're carrying? God, I pray for every person here today who feels like they're just carrying a backpack that's 100% of their body weight. Between now and next Sunday, would you help them remove it? Would you take off the burden, the pain, the guilt, the immorality, the lust, the pain? the anger, the rage, the slander, the lying, all the things that they're like, man, I'm so tired of. God, would you lead us into a place of freedom so that we can be light and be just like you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.